First Kings chapter 11, and a message I, I've titled today, Shelter in Jesus, right? Because we're all super familiar with the idea of sheltering in place now, and uh, various other terminology uh, for basically staying at home, you know, and trying to avoid this invisible uh, uh, virus, this invisible, dangerous uh, thing that's out there that could make us sick. And so we're very familiar with the idea of sheltering in place. And it's interesting, especially starting Friday, uh, largely, and, and I think one state maybe a couple days earlier, but nevertheless, across our country, everything from some governors uh, uh, relaxing some restrictions I appreciate in, in our state, uh, somewhat unique in that it's by, by zone or region uh, based on the data. And so it's kind of cool. In other states, uh, whole states, they've been way less impacted. And so they uh, have, have some additional uh, freedoms, perhaps, that, that, that maybe we don't have here in Polk County or wherever you're at. Uh, maybe you have them, maybe you don't. But, um, and then other, some states, you know, kind of full-on rebellion, it seems like, uh, perhaps due to overbearing leaders, I, I, I don't know, but uh, kind of this wide spectrum of responses. And as time goes on, that's probably only going to magnify, if you think about it, because certainly as time goes on, uh, there's going to be more and more what we call openings, right, where uh, businesses are, 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 are more free to uh, do business, which is vital uh, to their livelihoods, and, uh, you know, just kind of back to as close to normal as possible. And, and so there's going to be a loosening of restrictions, and, and almost every place you read and every official that's talking about it uh, speaks of sort of a phased-in approach. And, and clearly part of that, uh, really an underlying all of it, and I appreciate that about our state, is that at the end of the day, it's up to you, the individual, right? I mean, our governor could say, hey, back to normal for everybody, and you could still choose to shelter in place. And, and in some cases, that might be wise, right? Uh, depending on where you're at and, and who you're around and your personal health situation. I don't see that as being something that's viable, you know, in the super long term, but, but certainly as we sort of unpack, the, the unwind the situation that we're in, uh, there will be varying degrees of loosening up. And part of that will be us as individuals having to make decisions as, as uh, adults and family units on are we going to, uh, uh, where, where are we going to go with this as, as individuals and as family units? And so um, some that will be maybe sheltering in place for a longer period of time than others, and that's perfectly okay. You know, I, I look at this to some degree as uh, we read in uh, Romans, Paul talking about uh, the freedom for some eating meat sacrificed to idols and others not feeling that freedom. And so, you, you know, you kind of got to defer to conscience it, it, to a degree there. And, and so I, I think certainly it's not one size fits all is the takeaway there. And I think for unwinding this, it, it's not one size fits all. And so I think people who feel less safe going out should feel absolutely the freedom to shelter at home longer. And there's nothing wrong with that. And those who feel comfortable maybe going out with a mask um, might just go ahead and do that. Right? I understand what starting tomorrow, there's some stores that are requiring that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right? That's, that's their prerogative. And, and then for some that feel perfectly comfortable going out without a mask, you know? And so, uh, Important to, you know, if a business owner wants you to wear a mask, then wear a mask if you want to go in their store. And if you don't want to wear a mask, then I guess you don't go in their store. That's okay. But, you know, the idea is, is as we go forward, we're going to have these decisions to make. Are we going to shelter in place longer? Are we going to use various other means? But at the end of the day, my, my suggestion, and I think that something we see here in this passage, uh, at least a lesson we're going to learn from it, is that whatever we do, we, we can choose to shelter 
in the Lord Jesus Christ, in, in our relationship with him. And the cool thing about that is it's a personal, uh, intimate, interactive relationship. And if you haven't experienced that or, or, or come to that place, then I would encourage you, do that today. Uh, he, he said, follow me, right? That's, that's how he called his disciples, you know, come and follow me. And so, uh, you know, following him. And if you haven't come to that place, then, then, then do that. But as we go forward, certainly we can uh, do that regardless of what we do as far as our, our physical location. Uh, so 1 Kings chapter 11, and we left off last week reading about the, uh, the great wealth that Solomon was accumulating, right? The, the great, the number of horses we're going to see today, the number of wives, uh, we're going to see uh, just this, this radical wealth. And you, you, you remember, we've seen two different times that Solomon had this uh, wonderful uh, blessing of this appearance of the Lord to him, right? Kind of at the outset of uh, assuming the kingship, uh, really shortly after that in any ways, uh, you know, his dad had, had handed it off to him and then David passed away. And then sort of at the outset where he sort of uh, saw his uh, weakness, if you will, he, he understood the gravity of the responsibility that he had as king and realized, or at least felt like I'm not as great as my father is. And so how can I possibly do this? And so God appeared to him and he asked for wisdom to lead the people. And God said, because you asked for wisdom and not victory over your enemies and not, um, uh, you know, great wealth, I'm going to give you fame and wealth and everything much greater than uh, anybody has experienced. And so uh, we see sort of a change, though, in his priorities, unfortunately, from a focus on wisdom, in fact, even in some of the wording we see, uh, to, to more of a, now the, the wealth seems to be kind of forefront. And that can be a, a risk or, or a danger to, um, to, to us. And so here in 1 Kings chapter 11, uh, we're going to read about that. And so, but before we do that, I want to jump back to Deuteronomy chapter 17, because this will give us Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So jump over to Deuteronomy chapter 17, and we're going to see why some of the things happen that happened to uh, him in this passage. Deuteronomy chapter 17, pick it up in verse 14. So this, this is uh, principles, right? God speaking to uh, the, the nation there. And he says, when you come to the land, which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses one from among your brethren. So it would be a king that God raised up and put in place as we know he did with King David and King Solomon here now is, is the king. Um, you may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. So that's just wise, right? We have similar laws in our country uh, to make sure that the person who's ruling over us is truly an American. Verse 16, but he shall not multiply Horton. So this is important, right? So this is God speaking of future kings to the nation of Israel. But, but he, that is the king, shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither, listen to this, neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he multiply silver and gold for himself. So, uh, and then read on. Also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of the law in a book from the one before the priests of the Levites, and it shall be with them, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord as God, and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. Listen to this, that his heart may, be not, may not be lifted above his brethren, from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So, so God had given this very specific and important uh, command to the children of Israel about their king. He was not to multiply horses. 
He was not to multiply wives and not to uh, uh, really strive to gain for himself great wealth. What exactly is it that we see Solomon doing? Well, unfortunately, we're going to see in our passage that uh, we see him doing those uh, very things, tragically. And so, equally as important, as I, I appreciate about the Lord in that passage where he says, you know, don't do these things, he also says, here's what you're to do, and it has to do with the future king and his focus on his relationship with the Lord. Uh, with God's word, right? And keeping his statutes and following the Lord. And so uh, some pretty clear, and you would think relatively simple instructions. Now, now we know that God, God is the one who blessed Solomon with wealth, right? And so uh, there's nothing wrong with that, right? But we see the commandment is not to really strive for himself to do that. That's the idea there, right? So in other words, be content, but keep the main thing, the main thing, as we, as we spoke about last week, keep your focus on on the Lord. And so the, the clear commandment. So pick it up. Verse 1 of chapter 11. But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. So, unfortunately, right, Solomon didn't take heed to what God had clearly said in his word pertaining to kings, and he let the, the lust of the eye uh, get to him, and uh, he did exactly what God had told him not to do. Not only did he take multiple wives, but he took multiple wives from uh, uh, people groups that he specifically was commanded not to. And he had 700, so multiple is sort of an understatement, 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. So that, that, was, the, that was the key there, right? That, that the wives, this is why God has instructed the, the nation of Israel, and really to us as believers about being equally yoked uh, with, with those, you know, certainly with those we marry, uh, but even in terms of our, our closest relationships, those we take counsel and really trust in, uh, to, to make sure that you're getting uh, a godly counsel and that you're on the same page spiritually, which is really the, the foundation of our life, because if the foundation is different, that's going to create all sorts of problems. And so he had instructed the, the nation of Israel in terms of their king, and unfortunately King Solomon does not heed. For so it was, in verse 4, when Solomon was old, that his, wife turn, his wives turned his heart after other gods. So just as the Lord had said what happened, it happened. And it, you know, it boggles my mind. It's, it's, it's kind of sad. And I mean, we all uh, can be tempted to follow into it, right? You know, God says this because it's best for us. Uh, and, and don't do this, right? But do this, which is awesome. I, I love life. I'm, it's so awesome. The life and the opportunity that God has given us on this uh, amazing planet that he's created for us. And God says, here's the way to go. Walk in this way, and we want to walk in this way, right? We, we, we want to dabble in this way. And God tells us to walk in this way for a reason, right? Because it's the best for us. It's, it's what's, what's best for us. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. So we see here uh, the reason that that. Solomon begins to have some very significant problems. His heart is turned away from the Lord. David's heart was loyal. Was David perfect? Resounding no, he was not. We're all too well aware of David's many shortcomings, right? But he was a repentant man. That means he was a man that when he got off track, he admitted it, and he turned back to the Lord, right? Sometimes it took over a year that we know of, right? Other times it was, it was perhaps more quickly. But regardless, when he came to the realization of his sin, he was repentant, which means he was willing to change. And that's so important for us uh, as well to be willing to change. Solomon, not so much. Verse 5, For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So his, his wives did exactly what the Lord had said they would do. The multiple wives from different regions of the world started to turn his heart. In fact, it appears turned his heart to these other gods. And I don't know why we're so prone to think that uh, anything should be different for us, right? 
God says do this, and yet we want to do this. And, and, and so often throughout, you know, you, you read the news or you watch the news and you see many of the things that are so tragic. And right, life happens. There's things that we cannot control and certainly that the people that are involved cannot control. But there's so many things that people have made decisions that God says don't do that. And they do it. And they end up in hurt and pain. And they end up causing hurt and pain for others. And, and God says, don't do that, right? And they do it, and they think they can get away with it, and they can't. And, and boy, it, 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 it's um, so problematic and so troubling and so sad, in fact, uh, when, when that happens. And, and uh, it's important for us to say, Lord, I want to do what you want to do. And we see Solomon here, his heart, and now it, it, you see it sort of ramping up in verse 6. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. And did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. So not only did he sort of veer off, right? But it starts that way. Oh, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll try, you know, or, or nobody will find out. And the next thing you know, now he's full on doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And so, um, verse 7, Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. Some of the just terrible, terrible gods of, of the, the people of the land. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrifice to their gods. So no, no wonder his heart was turned away, right? He was too busy trying to please multiple wives and worship their gods. They're helping them to worship their gods. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice Right? The scriptures even point that out again. Right? He had appeared to him twice. What a special honor and privilege that that was. Right? We're blessed to have constant communion and fellowship uh, with, the Lord, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but, but Solomon had this, this, this unique and special experience uh, that we don't read of a lot in the scriptures of, of God appearing to him potentially because of the, the gravity and, and the, the importance of, of what he was embarking on. But God points out here that he, God became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord and, and who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. And this should have been gripping for, for Solomon. You know, and, and I'll be honest with you, I, I believe that if Solomon would have fallen on his face and repented before the Lord and apologized and torn down these altars to these false gods and started pursuing the Lord, his God with all of his heart, like his father David had, that God would have, would have forgiven him. God so much like that. We, we don't read about that. Um, and, and, and he just keeps on doing what he's been doing. And so, uh, you know, God is, and we'll see, God is going to really take away the kingdom. But because of God's grace, nevertheless, verse 12, I will not do it in your days. For the sake of your father, David, I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. There's a lot here. We could spend the rest of the hour on, on, um, on, on this alone, right? You, you know, people have all sorts of questions. You know, why is, why is Solomon's son being punished for Solomon's conduct? You know, uh, why? Because you see that other places in scriptures where it appears that, you know, the, uh, uh, the nation at a certain point in time are, are punished for what happened before. But the truth is, like, unfortunately, Likely, because of the example that was set in Solomon, the hearts of their children were distant from the Lord as well, right? And so, but the, the, the takeaway here, right, is the grace of God, right? He, is, he, has, he has cried out to Solomon and instructed him in the way that he should go. Solomon slowly over time his heart has drifted away and maybe some of you you would say you know what maybe it's kind of because of the the, the change in habits during this 
uh, a crisis time. Uh, maybe some of you have, have, have never really been, uh, 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 some, you know, had something important like, you know, had the Bible or reading the Bible as important, you know, so maybe it's not a, not, not a drift, but now something that you're interested in. Praise the Lord. But it can be so easy for us to, to drift. Solomon drifted, and now he's in outright rebellion, walking away from the things of the Lord. But I love it that God is so faithful to the word that he promised to King David. Right? He, he promised to King David that there would always be someone on the throne, right? as long as they, 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 they follow him. Our takeaway this morning is that God wonderfully blesses those who follow him, right? God wonderfully blesses those who follow him. Unlike what Solomon did, my exhortation to you and for myself this morning is guard your heart from being distracted from the plan that God has for you, right? God wonderfully blesses those who follow him. Not, not necessarily those who follow him perfectly, and that's a, a no-brainer because nobody does, right? Solomon's dad is a perfect example. But we see clearly here that in Solomon's life, it's going to be very costly because he allowed his heart to be stolen away from the Lord. Now, I would suggest, in fact, I'm confident, uh, none of us uh, talking today, listening today, um, have a thousand wives that are distracting us from the things of the Lord. But we might have a thousand other interests, or we might have two or three other interests that distract us from the things of the Lord. Right? We all have responsibilities. We all have things to do. God's blessed us wonderfully, and we should uh, enjoy the Lord and all that he's done for us, right? But it's important to keep priorities in the right space. So know this, that God wonderfully blesses those who follow him. Right, so guard your heart. Solomon was not careful to guard his heart. Right, he made a, a, a series of a number of decisions that allowed his heart to drift away from the simplicity of that sweet relationship with Jesus. Jump with me to uh, Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. And, and this is just one of numerous examples of the great blessing uh, of walking with the Lord. Walking with the Lord is, is I guess, sort of a Christianese term for, for living for Jesus, following Jesus, doing what God wants you to do. You sort of get the idea of walking hand in hand, you know, going in the same direction. Um, uh, in Matthew chapter 11, and I, I think this would likely apply to many of us today, in verse 28, a, a pretty well-worn uh, passage that is powerful and perhaps will be a blessing to you this morning or, or whenever you're listening to this. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus speaking, he says, come to me, right? When he called the disciples, he says, follow me. It, it, it's not that complicated. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. So labor, heavy laden, you get the idea of, of tired, worn out. Sometimes that could be emotional, right? Sometimes the emotional worn out is as difficult, if not more difficult, than physical. But whatever the case may be, he says, come to me. Right? All you who labor, you're, you're worn out, you're tired. Maybe you're frustrated. Maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you don't think you can take anymore. Right? I remember reading one time about I was a Navy SEAL, I think. I was reading a Navy SEAL. I didn't say I was. <laughs> I was reading a Navy SEAL. And he said, studies have shown that when you think you don't have another breath to give, right, when you think you're done physically, you're actually only about 40% done. And, and that's, that's, that's how they train. You know, the, the most, most um, uh, of, the, of the Navy SEAL uh, training courses are designed that the average American athlete could, could finish, right? Physically could finish. The, the part, the difficult part's the mental, right? You think you can't. You think you're at your end. You think you're done. You can't do anything more and you can't. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are labor, or who labor and heavy laden, 
and I'll give you rest. What exactly is it that is needed for the person who is tired, who's worn out emotionally, physically, spiritually? They need rest, right? Different kinds of rest, but probably all of that, those kinds of rest. And Jesus meets them right where they're at, and he says, come to me, I'll give you exactly what you need. I love that about the Lord. When Jesus healed a leper, what did he do? Often he touched them. Did Jesus have to touch a leper to heal them? Not at all, right? We, 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 we see all, all sorts of examples of people being healed without being touched. Why would he touch a leper? Because part of being a leper in society is nobody would touch you. The very thing a leper craved was to be touched, to be embraced, to be, have human contact, because nobody would touch him, because lepers, leprosy was so contagious. So Jesus would touch him. He'll give you exactly what you need. Maybe not what you want all the time, but what you need. Come to me, all you who labor and have laid, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, which basically means humble, and you will find rest for your souls. Man, now, now we're getting deeper than just physical rest, right? We, we, we know what it is to have physical rest. You know, nap, I, I was uh, uh, watching a movie last night. Um, uh, uh, the Last Full Measure, really good, by the way, I recommend it. Um, and there's a scene where the dad of, of the soldier that they're, they're trying to get this Medal of Honor for. Um, he, he comes into the room and he says, you know, growing old isn't the hard part. Just staying awake, staying awake long enough to enjoy it is, right? In other words, you know, he was just coming out of a nap, right? And so, man, getting old is not the hard part, but staying awake to enjoy it, that's hard sometimes, right? Sometimes we just need rest and that's okay, right? Jesus says, come and I'll, 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 I'll give you rest and take my yoke upon you. The idea there is just learn about me. In fact, some of your translations, I didn't copy down another one, but we'll say, learn from me. Learn about me. Learn about Jesus so that you can follow him. And I'll give you rest, not just physical rest, like a good nap, which are great, but rest for your souls. That's much deeper. And he says, for, for, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Doesn't that dispel so many myths about the Lord. I mean, right here, Jesus says, I'm gentle and lowly in heart. So, so gentle, we all understand that. Lowly in heart, humble, right? And his, his yoke is easy, like, like walking with Jesus. Why is it that so many think God is out to get them? Why is it that so many think that God is angry with them all the time? That, that God doesn't love them? When right here, Jesus says just the opposite. Come to me, he says. Jump with me real quick, if you would, to Psalm chapter 91. Psalm chapter 91. Good verse to memorize, or a good number of verses here in Psalm 91 to memorize, and I think somewhat uh, uniquely applicable to today. Psalm 91, in, in verse 1, we're going to look at the first uh, six verses. He who dwells... In the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So you just get the idea of just, again, kind of drawn near to God, right? Dwelling in the, the secret place, abide under the shadow. You can't be in the shadow unless you're pretty close, right? I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Right? We're talking about Sheltering in Jesus, resting in Jesus, Re regardless of what your physical activity uh, uh, is in coming days, weeks, months, years, right? We, we can all rest and shelter in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He can be our refuge, our fortress. That's the idea, right? We're sheltering in place now to be uh, uh, separate from this virus, Lord willing. Verse 3, Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. So from the traps that are out there is the idea. 
And, and there is one who does try to trap us, right? The enemy of our soul is the devil. He'll set all sorts of traps, and he's had all sorts of millennia to practice, right? So all the more reason to stay close to Jesus, right? Let, you know, someone says, the devil knocks on the door, let Jesus answer for you, right? Just, just leave it to Jesus. You just stay in Jesus. Verse 4, he shall cover you with his feathers. Now this, this is one of those things where it's important when studying the scriptures, as, as we do at Calvary Chapel, we study verse by verse through the word of God. And one important principle is, is to take the Bible absolutely literally, unless it's obvious that it's not literal. So here, when he says, he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge, doesn't mean that God has wings or feathers. But you get the idea of just that gentle coddling. You've heard the story probably of, of the, the, the prairie fires that used to race the crop, or probably still do to some degree, but you know, they, when I'm driving through Kansas, they'll burn certain areas on purpose, right, to make it safer for future fires not getting, wildfires getting out of, out of control. And, be, and because those prairie fires can just go so quickly, and there's been stories of the, the prairies, uh, uh, fires just sweeping across, and uh, uh, baby birds being found safely, chickens underneath the wings of their, 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 their mom, but the mom's dead. The mom was burned, but gave her life for sheltering her, her chicks. And so that's the idea here, not that God actually has wings or feathers, right? And so it's important to, to take the Bible uh, literally, unless it's obvious that it's not. And so he'll, he'll protect you is the idea here. His truth, and that's very important, right? That's why we study verse by verse through the Word of God, to get to know God's Word, because his truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. Right? We don't have to fear. Nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. We, we can shelter in the Lord. We can rest in the Lord. And, and it's a personal relationship. And how God might guide you in the coming days might be a little different than how he guides me or your neighbor or or a, a family member, or whatever, and that's okay, right? Enjoy the Lord, shelter in Jesus, and, and be gracious and loving to one another, but, but realize the, the great blessing of walking with the Lord. God wonderfully blesses those who follow him. So guard your heart. Guard your heart from being distracted. In fact, I didn't have this in my notes, but I think in Psalm 4, jump, or excuse me, Proverbs chapter 4, um, Yeah, yeah, verse 23. Pick it up in verse 20, though. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your, your ear to my sayings. You see this sort of progression, right? Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. So God's word, that the truth of the Lord, knowing the Lord, for they are life to those who find them, and they are health to all their flesh, right? The truth of God's word, the truth of relationship with the Lord. And then he says, keep your heart, or some translations say, Guard your heart with all diligence. It takes effort. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. So the importance of guarding our heart. He, God blesses those who follow him. So guard your heart from being distracted. And I know we're, we're not going to get through this whole passage today. I don't want to uh, cut short. We'll, we'll, uh, I don't want to uh, uh, not do it all justice. So we'll uh, uh, go through a few more points here and then, um, but, but guard your heart. And, and if that is, uh, uh, if you don't remember anything else, remember the, the blessings of, of resting in the Lord Jesus Christ, that interactive loving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't experienced that, that first step of, uh, of just surrender is really the idea, right? Where, where you surrender your life, you say, Jesus, I'll follow you. Please forgive me of my sins. I, I acknowledge I've sinned against you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for taking my sin uh, upon yourself and forgiving me. Please come into my heart and my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and your power to follow you all the days of my life as I commit myself to you, Jesus. Amen. Pray that prayer. Make that surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. I encourage you, if you haven't done that, do that, do that today. 
and enter into this, this, this blessed place and realize that, that God will lead you in, in what he has for you, right? But we have to be willing to follow. So guard your heart. Guard your heart from being distracted away. Secondly, it's important to guard against old habits creeping back in to cripple you or to create trouble for you. Right? We're going to see in, in the next section here that um, some of Solomon's well, well, enemies of the nation of Israel, that had sort of been quiet for a while, uh, now kind of rear their ugly heads. And so let's pick it up in verse 14. Now the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon. And it's interesting, the Lord did it, right? The Lord was, uh, his heart, of course, would have been to bring correction into Solomon's life. And that's why some, sometimes God does bring difficulty to us because he loves us. And, and he'll speak to our heart, right, as he had to Solomon, likely for years. He had appeared to him uniquely and, and, and specially, uh, but Solomon didn't heed. He didn't, you know, no doubt there had been difficulties, right? We, we read about that. And so now the Lord is raising up uh, judgment, correction, what, what he would have hoped for a correction, but Solomon doesn't take heed, so it's going to come in the form of the nation uh, being split in half. So the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon, Hadad, the Edomite. He was a descendant of the king of Edom. For it happened when David was in Edom, and Joab, the commander of the army, had gone up to bury the slain after he had killed every male in Edom, because for six months Joab remained there with all Israel until he had cut down every male in Edom, that Hadad fled to go to Egypt, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him. Hadad was still a little child, so they had wiped out the, the uh, uh, Joab, remember the general had wiped out the adult males. The son splits down to Egypt, but he uh, has vengeance in his heart. And so now many, many years have passed. David has died, and he wants to go back and seek vengeance. So uh, verse 18, uh, Then they arose from Midian and came to Paran, and they took uh, men with them from Paran and came to Egypt, to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who gave him a house, appointed food for him, and gave him land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so that he gave him as wife the sister of his own wife, that is, the sister of Queen uh, Taphnes. Then the sister of Taphnes bore him uh, Janubath, his son, whom Taphnes weaned in Pharaoh's house. And Janubath was in Pharaoh's household among the sons of Pharaoh. So when Hadad heard in Egypt that David rested with his fathers, or that David had died, and that Joab, the commander of the army, was dead. So these uh, former adversaries, these ones who had, uh, in his mind, uh, both were in the same camp, had committed this atrocity against his family. Hadad said to Pharaoh, Let me depart, that I may go to my own country. Then Pharaoh said to him, But, but what have you lacked with me, that suddenly you seek to go to your own country? And so he answered, Nothing, but let me go anyways. In other words, he had had a good life. Pharaoh had taken him in and, and cared for him and given him a good life. And and wants him to stay there. And he says, no, it's, it's been great, but I want to go back. And we'll see that his, he has vengeance on his mind. God raised up another adversary against him, Rezon, the son of Eli, Eliada, who had fled from his lord, had a deezer, the king of Zobah. So he gathered men to him and became captain over a band of raiders. So kind of that guerrilla warfare is what we're talking about here, not formal army on army, but just going to go stir up trouble. Uh, uh, when David killed those of Zobah, and they went to Damascus and dwelt there and reigned in Damascus. He was an adversary of Israel all the days of Solomon, besides the trouble that Hadad caused, and he abhorred Israel and reigned over uh, uh, Syria. So in other words, these, these factions, right, that had, had uh, been quiet, now we see that the Lord, because he's going to bring this judgment against uh, Solomon, against the nation, no doubt all of them were departing uh, uh, from they are being distracted from the things of God. And so um, we, we see these problems that it, it, arguably in Solomon's case, it didn't even know they existed. But for the nation of Israel, prior adversaries, prior uh, problem areas that were quiet. But now they're going to rear their ugly head and they're going to create challenges for the nation of Israel. And so the takeaway for us is we need to guard ourselves against old habits creeping back in. Maybe there's things that we haven't thought about. And how often do you hear this? Sometimes 
uh, tragic stories of, of Christian leaders who have fallen and, you know, I thought I had overcome that or, or you know, I thought I had it under control or, or equally as tragically, I thought nobody knew, you know, and, 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 and yet th these things rear their head and create all sorts of problems. And so it's important for us to guard against old habits or perhaps even new bad habits creeping in that would distract you from the things of the Lord. Sometimes after a great spiritual victory is when the enemy hits hardest. Our, our, our guard is sort of down. And so that's why in Proverbs 4 there we read to guard our hearts, right? Guard our hearts. Here, in, here as I mentioned, uh, Solomon wasn't even aware that they had still existed. And, and it's interesting here, Solomon, who had these two, what you might call unique experiences with the Lord. And yet those unique experiences weren't enough to keep him. And, and I, would, I would say that's a, a good word of warning for um, many today who seek experience rather than a, a consistent, steady relationship and walk with the Lord. Right, there, there, there's experience-based ministries out there that try to get us hyped up or, or, or get us, you know, thinking we need some unique experience rather than just simple surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, being filled with His Holy Spirit, empowered by His Holy Spirit, and living for Him day to day, week by week, month by month, hour by hour, in loving relationship with Him. Right, it speaks of Solomon had these two radical experiences, unlike you know most people ever experience. But it wasn't enough to keep him. And experiences, right, mountaintop experiences, they're amazing, they're wonderful. But but that alone is not enough to keep us. We need to walk in the truth of God's word. I'm going to give you a couple passages. We'll go there quick, and then we'll pick it up next week here uh, as we as we finish out this because it, it's super important the things that we see here in in, in this passage in terms of sheltering in and resting in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jump with me uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll start in verse 1. Paul says, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So what, what, what God has entrusted to us, this is what God entrusted to him. What God has entrusted to you, what he's entrusted to me. And he says, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. That's a key right there. Right? What, what is Jesus, right? The words that we long to hear when we stand before him. Right? We read, uh, enter in my good and faithful servant, right? We're, we're, we're called to be faithful to whatever it is that God has called us to, right? And, and that is, is experienced and lived out in our minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, consistent relationship and walk with the Lord. So I want to encourage you a couple couple verses I'm going to give you. In fact, uh, the New Living Translation uh, of 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, Now a person who is put in charge as a manager, so that doesn't necessarily mean your you know, title at work or whatever, but whatever God has put you in charge of, it must be faithful. Right? That's, that's, um, that's, how, that's, that's one of the, the tools employed, one of the keys to victory, Right? Because we're talking about guarding our hearts, guarding our lives against the things that would tend to creep in to distract us from the things of God. And, and in order to help prevent that, it's just important to be faithful. So, a couple passages to read before next week. Finish out, of course, 1 Kings chapter 11, and we'll, we'll pick up here where we left off. Also consider Matthew chapter 25 and verse 23, and consider Hebrews uh, chapter 3 and verse 5. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this, right? Because we, we want to encourage our, our, our daily and weekly and hourly 
interactive, loving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to in, encourage us to use that as a, as, a, as a means of steering clear of the error of Solomon, which was allowing his heart to be distracted from his relationship with the Lord. And then last but not least, uh, as, we, as we come back next week, we'll see that God is always faithful to his word. God is always faithful to his word, and it's, a, it's always a good time to return and trust in him. It's always a good time to choose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, this, the, as, as we talk about sheltering in Jesus, as we talk about allowing him to be our rest and our peace during this time, and really going on forever, right? Because as things unwind, it's going to be a little bit different perhaps for each of us. Remember that God wonderfully blesses those who, who uh, follow him. So it, it's so important to guard our hearts from being distracted away from the things of the Lord. Secondly, to guard against old habits, as we saw uh, old adversaries here to the nation of Israel uh, creep back in. So guard ourselves against those things that would creep in and distract us. And then last but not least, and we'll talk more about this next week, realize that God is always faithful to his word and to his people. And therefore, it is always a good time to return or to choose to follow him. And that covers the whole spectrum, whether, whether you've been doing that, following him faithfully and consistently, whether maybe you haven't been and you need to come back, or maybe you haven't really ever followed the Lord. And the Bible says now is the time and today is the day. Maybe today is the day you, you would choose to say, Jesus, I surrender myself. I'm going to follow you. And, it, and it's just, it's not complicated. Begin to follow him. Pick up the Bible. I would recommend starting to read in the, in the Gospel of John in the New Testament. Great uh, accounting of the life of Jesus written very, very simply. Right? Proverbs is a great book. Psalms is a great book to spend some time in uh, as you have time. And then, of course, the, the Word of God being the primary way that God speaks to us. He's always going to speak to us consistent with his Word. And the primary way that we speak to the Lord is through prayer. And so pray, spend time talking to God, allow him to talk to you. 